29th worship service. I'm Terry Lubarch and I will be your worship leader for today's service. The community lunch will be serving meatloaf, au gratin potatoes, peas, and dessert on Tuesday from 11 to 1. Come and enjoy that. And they do it to go as well. So if you don't have time to stay, just get it to go. Concordia Friends will be meeting Tuesday at 11.30. You can, oh wait, pick up a lunch at the community store. Uh, lunch at the community lunch, not the store. You could go shopping at the store. I got this. <laughs> Groveport Madison Human Needs is collecting shoes for school-aged children until October 6th. There is a box in the Narthax for your donations. It is time. I know, I just felt like saying that. It is time to update the church directory. Please let the church office know if there are any changes to your information or anybody you may know or love or don't know. The October specials for the community store are betting items. Bingo happens Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Come on out and have some fun and don't forget to bring your donation for the food pantry that night. The Southeast Library needs volunteers for its Reading Buddies program and School Help Center. Take a look at the flyers that are outside of the church office for more information. And as always, check your insert for any additional information that may or may not be there. All righty then. If you would please stand for this morning's first song. Oh, my. 
Let us pray. O oh God of all life and all being, God of holy community, as those who were created in your own image and likeness, we know that you have created us to belong to one another. You have created us to mirror you as a larger holy community. And today you challenge us to know and live as though we are a family, members of one another, that whatever may come, good or bad, we are in this life and in this faith together. Please open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts that our circle of faith, our circle of belonging, opened by Christ himself, would remain open to anyone who comes seeking solace, community, forgiveness, or anything that ministry or some resource of God can be entrusted. May we pray, study, and praise as those who are in it together. May our worship be pleasing to you, O oh God. And may the blessings overflow in us, around us, and upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please feel free to remain standing, but it's okay if you need to sit or want to sit. Either one. Is what we do. Good morning. How are all the children of God today? Good to hear. I appreciate the rain. Raining. We haven't had that for a hot minute. I appreciate the rain. Yep. I'd appreciate it more if it would rain when I wasn't having a really good hair day, or if I didn't have to drive in it, or if it would just rain at night when I want to sleep because I like that. But I appreciate the rain. There we go. I appreciate technology. I do. I appreciate technology. Until I don't. Like when it doesn't do what I want it to. Or when it irritates me a lot. Or when it doesn't do what I think it needs to do in the timeline that I think it needs to do it. But I appreciate technology. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I appreciate that God has a plan. 
No, really, I do. I appreciate that God has a plan, Pastor Sherry. I wish that sometimes God would let me in on, you know, just a little preview. Here's what I'm going to do. Just do that. (laughs) I'm going to make that happen. (laughs) Oh, turn left. No, wait, go right. But I appreciate that God has a plan. Yeah. Okay, so it's about control. I can't control the rain. I can't control technology. I can't control... Duh. So anyway, the point being is that my ripe old age now, I have to learn to let it go. To know that God has a plan for me, and it may not be what I think it should be, just like technology has a plan, even though I'm it's not necessarily what I think it should be. And that the rain is delightful, even though it's not at the right time of day. Can't control the weather. Can't control technology. Go ahead. Try to control God. See how that goes for you. It won't. So I've learned that in my old age. I highly recommend learning that sooner. Um, if I get to do this again, I will learn that sooner. So let's have a prayer. Dear God. Thanks for the rain rain. and all the people who created technology. And And thank you for your plan for us. us. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Today's scripture is from James 5, 13 through 20, and it's adapted from the message translation of the Bible. Prayer to be reckoned with. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with the oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed, inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human, just like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't, not a drop for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came, and everything started growing again. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back. And you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, in the last song that we sang, it said, just know you're not alone because we're going to make this place your home. Know you're not alone. We are in this together, and that's what the scripture is about today. Yes, it's about prayer, but it's about more than just prayer. In this together, let's pray first. God, in the words in this together, those words have never been more true today as in any other time. At a time when the nation is more polarized than I've ever seen, Now is a perfect opportunity for us, the church, to model togetherness for the nation and for the world, to model what Christ-like unity should be. As we step into your holy scriptures, O God, may we remember that none of this is about us and what we want or what we think is right, but that it is 100% about you and what you want and what you think is right So please, God, help us hear what you say today, that we might take to heart what it is you want us to take with us. We pray today, all of us, with open ears, eyes, minds, and hearts to hear your voice 
embrace your will and serve your son in Jesus' name. God, bind the spirit of the enemy, for Satan has no place among us today or forevermore. We reclaim this church and this territory in the name of Jesus, our holy Savior. Speak today. May it be your word and only your word that goes forth from this pulpit today. Amen. We want to be clear that the passage that we read from James 5 is about the power of prayer. That's true. But what stood out to me as I studied these words, that the power of prayer is magnified when we pray together. It makes a difference in our lives. It makes a difference in our church. It makes a difference in our neighborhood. It makes a difference in our world. When we, the church, think and act as though we are in this faith, in this life, in this world, together. None of us is a loner. We're all here with God and one another. In the human realm, yes, sometimes we have to take a stand, and sometimes that stand puts us in a place that we are the lone voice speaking against whatever it is or speaking up for whatever it is. But in this life, in this faith, We are never alone unless we choose to be alone. And I believe that we know we're not alone, number one, because we always have God, and that's God, Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit. Plus, we always have those that make up that great cloud of witnesses that you can read about in Hebrews. Plus, we should always have one another, contemporaries in the faith. We know we're not alone because... In this faith together is what James is talking about. James is talking about, in general, not just in chapter 5, how we treat one another and how our lives should reflect the faith that should be at work in us and through us. And the word church actually refers to congregation or assembly, coming together. It's reiterating that by God's plan, we are supposed to be the universal church, the universal community, one community in this together, working together to bring Christ to everyone. It's a community that is always meant to be ever expanding, not one that's supposed to have rigid boundaries where people are cast out, but one where the boundary is always expanding because Christ died that all might enter in. We are supposed to be in this faith, in this life, in this church together. So what does that require? It requires some important things. If you're doing great, then what do you do? It's a sing together. Rejoice. And if you're sick, what do you do? You call for the elders to pray over you and anoint you so that healing might be yours. And that, of course, is according to the will of God. If we believe when we pray together... That healing, in whatever form God chooses, is ours, physically and spiritually, then it is ours. Whatever we do in church, we need to remember that we are always in this together with God and one another. In other words, we're not God vigilantes sent to do what we want to do. Now, in the scripture or the translation that I chose, the message, the subtitle of our passage is prayer to be reckoned with. Other translations simply say, the power of prayer. Oops, sorry. Um, But the key is that prayer makes a difference. And all of us should know that and believe that and live that. Verse 15 says this, believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you back on your feet. And if you sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. When we pray, things happen, and because we are in this together, when we pray together, things really happen. Believing prayer, as the message translation puts it, can heal you body and soul. During our time of prayer, we list prayer concerns and pray for them specifically because we are in this life together. We are in this faith together, and when we do that, we are following the admonition of Scripture, praying for one another. So to summarize, if you're hurting, pray. If you're you're feeling great, sing. If you're sick, send for the elders of the church that they might come together and pray for you and anoint you with oil in the name of Jesus. 
And we don't want to skip over the fact that the act of anointing with oil symbolizes divine blessing and healing. And you can read about that in Mark 6 or Luke 10. Some of these things we do routinely when we say we pray for others. And some of the things in this passage we do on an as-needed basis. But there are other things that are meant to clarify or instruct our life together in the church that we simply avoid altogether. For example, consider verse 16. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Hmm. Perhaps at the core of the brokenness of the church universal is our neglect of this instruction as what is to be our common practice. The scripture is clear. Make this your common practice so you can live together whole and healed. The implication is that the neglect of this instruction would lead us either not in living together or in our living together not to be healed or whole. That's a pretty big sacrifice when you think that it's coming at the cost of vanity or perhaps perceived safety, whatever reason we choose for not confessing our sins to one another. Let's remember, because I'm sure we probably haven't forgotten, but let's say it anyway, Confession involves humility and mutual accountability. And most of us don't like humility, at least not in us. It's okay with other people. And we're not that fond of accountability. So let's just skip that. But when we skip it, we're sacrificing community healing and community wholeness. I'm certain, I'm not certain rather, that we've ever really considered the trade-off. What is it that we're giving up when we stop doing the things that make us uncomfortable? Vanity and safety versus healing and wholeness. And when you have mutual confession, mutual accountability, the point is that safety is really built in because if you tell my business, what do you think I'm going to do? You can say it. You already know, right? You're going to tell. If I tell yours, you're going to tell mine. So if we confess to one another, isn't it much more likely that everybody's going to keep it in, uh, uh, what do you call it, private? Because nobody wants their sin publicly exposed. But more than that, God has created us to be in community, that we're supposed to be able to do that. That's what keeps us in line with what God has called us to do. And it's not just as simple as, If you confess and I tell your business, then I've done something wrong. Because guess what? That's God's command. If you confess to me and I confess to you and then I go tell, not only have I broken your trust, who do I have to answer to? God. So are we really not doing it because we're fearful? Or are we really not doing it because we don't want to talk about what we've done wrong? That's a rhetorical question, but it's something we should think about. Because there was a time in church when there was confession and people actually stood up and talked about what they did wrong. And they held one another accountable in love. But we don't do that anymore. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together healed and whole. When we confess our sins to each other, when we know what's going on in each other's lives, guess what? It changes how we're able to pray. I can pray for you differently when I know what's wrong. And the more specific our prayers are, the more specific we are in asking God for what we want And the real power is God receiving our prayers and God's action. These are all ideas about how we live together in community because we don't have to have instructions about mutual accountability and mutual confession and community prayer if we're in it alone. These are actually blessings, even though it doesn't sound like a blessing for me to be accountable to somebody else, for me to talk about what I did wrong to somebody else. But it's a blessing that leads to healing and wholeness And we sacrifice that when we stop it. Verse 16 also includes these words. The power, I'm sorry, the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. The New Century Version says the the same uh, verse these ways. 
When a believing person prays, great things happen. Or the New Living Translation says it this way. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. No matter how you translate it, prayer by a faithful follower has incredible power. And God is ultimately responsible for what happens. But our prayers matter because God says, ask for what you want. And always we should want God's will, but we're supposed to ask for what we want. My prayers for myself are important, but my prayers for all of the rest of you are something powerful to be reckoned with. And the same is true for everyone else. Your prayer for yourself is important, but your prayer for everybody else is a power to be reckoned with. Because we are in this together, There is power in the community of Christ. There is power in numbers, as so many sayings imply. But let's be real. The truth is prayer is both simple and complicated. And we know this because of many examples where we pray for sick people to get well. Sometimes they are healed, and they're even better in this life. And sometimes they actually die, and their healing comes in God's eternal realm. Why is it that some get well and some die? Only God knows, but our prayers still make a difference. Perhaps that one who died might have spent weeks, months, or years suffering before they died had we not prayed for healing. We will never know unless we decide to ask God. It's still important when we get to heaven. Our faithful prayers connect with God's power to move mountains And to do all the things that scripture says, our faithful prayer connects with God's power to do all the things that we have seen in our lives, that we have read of in the scriptures, all of the things that we know about. Personally, I've never prayed for it not to rain for three and a half years, but Elijah did. And as unbelievable as it seems, the scripture says that God honored that prayer. And then at the end of those three and a half years, the rain came and everything started growing again. Now, thankfully, whoever prayed for no rain here didn't say for three and a half years, but you get what I'm going at, right? There's nothing guaranteed, but when we pray in fair, pray, oh goodness, pray in faith, <laughs> Our prayer connects with God's power, and there's no limit to what can happen. And consider where the passage is going. It says if faith-based prayer is enough to stop the rains for three and a half years, then the scripture says it's also enough to bring back a believer who has lost faith or has simply wandered away from their life of faith. The scripture says, don't write them off, go after them, get them back, and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction. We are in this faith life together, and this passage is really about putting some skin in the game. At the end of the day, we can say we have faith, but are we willing to pray for somebody? We can say we have faith, but when God does something great, are we willing to sing praises together about God? When we need healing, are we willing to pray for healing together? Are we willing to confess our sins to one another and hold one another accountable? And when somebody from the life of faith walks away, are we willing first to go after them and try to win them back that they might return to the life of faith as they understand it? Or do we just say, well, they made a wrong choice. They just backslid. They went back into their old life. And you write them off and take their names off the church rolls and never give it a second thought. What do we do in this life of faith? It's easy to talk about faith. But some of these things, like mutual accountability, confessing our sins as a common practice, those things aren't easy. But nowhere does the scripture that J- the letter that James wrote, no- nowhere does he say the life of faith that we're in together is meant to be easy. I believe it's easier because we're in it together, because we're all supposed to do this. But I don't know that it's supposed to be easy because we're being asked to live in a way that's contrary to the world where we're placed. Impossible if you're alone, 
Not impossible with God, especially not impossible with the cloud of witnesses and the people of the church today. Now I want you to pause for a moment and imagine what it would take, how this church and the church universal would have to change. How would the church have to change for you to fully embrace all of these verses? Not just some, but all of them. We do pray for one another. We do sing together. We do call on the church elders when we're sick, but we don't confess our sins to one another. We don't hold one another mutually accountable, which means how we pray for one another is changed because we don't know those secret sins, those secret struggles that need the most prayer. What would it take for us to live our lives that way? Would it be humility on the part of the other church members? Humility on my part? On your part? What would it take? If it's not about humility, what makes it so unsafe that we can't share our sins here? Because the problem is that the human tendency is if I'm not talking about my sin here, I'm probably not talking about it anywhere, including not talking about it to God. But when we do it together, and hold one another accountable, we're much more apt to talk about our sin and be honest about what we need when we pray to God individually, even in smaller groups. And speaking of smaller groups, let's remember that the church when it started was really what we would call a house church today. Smaller groups that met in individual homes. And confession was part of the collective life of the church. When the church gathered, it didn't matter whose home they gathered in. Part of what they did, besides praying and singing, was confessing their sins, holding one another accountable. They did all of these things. And sometimes what they did was plot how to go, plot not in a bad way, plan, have some kind of strategy for how to go after people who had wandered away from the faith. And when you go after them, you're not saving them. There's already a savior and it's none of us. But when we go after them, we just go and make sure their wandering away was intentional. Maybe something happened and they don't believe anymore. Maybe they've wandered away because they're hurt and they need somebody to come after them. We don't really know. But what we know is once one person wanders away and is forgotten, it's much easier for the next person to wander away and to be forgotten. And there's clearly blessing when we don't let that happen. How different would the church have to be for us to embrace all of the suggestions or commands, whatever you want to call them? How different would the church have to be for us to embrace all of the instructions in James? It takes trust in God and your church members to do some of these things. It takes a willingness to be honest, transparent, and vulnerable. It takes the commitment to be in this faith together. And it takes a commitment to love others as Christ loves you. Fun? Some of it, not at all. But it's obviously doable because we have God behind it. So how different does the church have to be? And then how different would you be if you were doing all of these things? How different then would your house be? How different would your neighborhood be if All of us took seriously the challenge to do all of these things, to pray together, sing together, be anointed together, confess our sins together, hold one another accountable. And that includes going after those who have wandered off to see why they've wandered off. And even if we don't know why, to hold them in prayer. Keep in mind, there is no command on which member or members of the church you confess to. Is it a meeting where everybody comes out, the whole church, and we all confess together? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't say that. Maybe it's just having a group where you confess to one another and hold one another accountable, and that there would be many, many accountability groups in the church. Who knows? But what we do know, or I think we can all admit, is that we would be more humble and that we would be more likely not to repeat a sin if we confessed it to somebody else and we held one another accountable. 
In this church, Asbury, we are in a season of illness and injury. It just seems like so many people are ill or injured or both. And so this idea of mutual accountability and praying and confessing our sins, it's appealing because what does it say? It leads to lives of healing and wholeness. We need healing and wholeness. What I don't know is how many people have wandered away from this church that might be turned back if we reached out. I don't know. And not just this church, but since we're all in this together, that would be every church. Sometimes we let them go. Sometimes we talk about why we think they left, but we don't really go after them. It doesn't say anything about talking about why they left, but not going after them. But when we do go after them, we need to go after them in love. Find out what's going on with them. And what would we do, regardless of what their answer is, whether they want to come back or not, what would we end with? Prayer. Something that I hope we are good at. We are not to tell them how to live. We're not to tell them what faith and the faith life looks like. That's between them and God. But what we're supposed to do is note whether or not they are living their life of faith, however it's defined to them, Because most of us know when somebody's wandered away, regardless of what the life of faith is defined by for them. Do we recognize the power of prayer? First, individual prayer, but second, community prayer, collective prayer, because this is all about the commitment to be in this together. Are we in this together? Are we in this together? We are in this together. And who brought us into this? God, through Jesus. One person brought all of us together. All of us have the same goals. All of us have the same mission. And we have to learn, if we don't already know how, to pray for one another earnestly. I don't have to like you to pray for God's best for you. And you don't have to like me to pray for God's best for me. Because God loves all of us. God never said we'd all be friends. Peter and Paul couldn't get along sometimes. But guess what? God loved both of them and God brought both of them into the church. And they have helped save many, many, many people over many, many, many generations. We are in this together. We pray for one another. We love one another. And I would hope that together we might pray for how to bring Mutual confession, mutual accountability, and mutual prayer related to that back into the life of the church. Not because we want to be in one another's business, but because such a practice keeps all of us humble, helps us live the life Christ encourages, and helps us stay accountable, yes, to our prayer partners, but most importantly to God. And why does it all matter? Because we're in this life We're in this faith. We're in this church together. And as long as we live, that will always be true. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we know there is suffering in our midst. So we pray with and for one another. We know there is illness in our midst. So we pray with and for one another. Gracious God, hear us as we pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Today, we pray for Cindy Vandenberg's neighbor, Brenda, who has pancreatic cancer. We pray for a family friend of uh, Cindy Vandenberg, whose 24-year-old son was killed in a car accident. We have continued prayers for Sharon Wilson with healing issues. We have prayer for Dick Sloan, who had surgery this week and is recovering in the hospital. We pray for Margaret Johnson, who continues to recover from her stroke and who still cannot drive. We pray for the family of Ann Eisler, who passed away in Orlando, Florida on September 22nd. We pray for Greg Swanson, who fell and broke his arm, ribs, hip, and leg and is in rehab. We pray for Becky Bickert's friend Heidi Polk for guidance on life decisions and for healing and pain relief. We pray for Laura Lascota with serious dental concerns. We pray for Connie Ewing, who has been struggling with pain and health issues. We pray for um, Holly Merritt. Uh, We've been praying for Holly and Mel. 
Uh, Melody Hill passed away during the night or early this morning, so we want to remember them. They are uh, parking lot worshipers, and they've been, uh, Melody's been ill for a while, so uh, we just want to remember um, Holly and, and all those who uh, mourn Mel's passing. Please continue to pray. I know you've been praying. Uh, we pray for all of the weary caregivers who need strength and encouragement to continue in their difficult role. God, we know there is also peace and happiness in our midst, and together we praise God for one another. Together we praise God for the gifts that we bring to the church. God, we thank you that you have put us in this life battle together. For in many ways, living the life of faith is a type of life battle. But the difference is we know the outcome because Christ has already guaranteed it. So God, thank you for the church, for all our flaws, for all our mistakes. The church is Christ in the world, and that we can never forget. So God, in Jesus' name, we pray, thanking you for accepting our prayers and our praises. God, in Jesus' name, we lift up these individuals and their circumstances because we believe with all our being that your power to heal is absolute. We believe that you can do what none other can. So we ask you to unleash your power in each situation, in each life, in those that grieve, bring comfort. Please, God, do whatever you feel you need to do. This we ask in Jesus' name. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen. Let us now join our voices together because God gave us this power to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today we've talked about prayer, and today we have offered our prayers as well as our praises to God. Let us continue our worship as we now offer to God our tithes and our gifts and our offerings for the furthering of God's work in the world. The ushers may come forward.
community, the holy three in one, we are grateful that you have created us to be in a community and you have challenged us to love one another, nurture one another, and pray for one another. As a demonstration of our love and gratitude, we bring before you a portion of our gifts from us. We pray that you will find our offering acceptable and we ask that you please bless and multiply what we have offered today. May our offering be more than enough for us, your church, to flourish as we love and serve Christ in our neighborhood and in the world today. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. When life gets you down, may James's words be a reminder that you are not alone because commands on how we live in community is an indicator that we are not alone. We are in this life. We are in this faith. We are in this church together by God's designed design. James reminds us that our task is to put hands and feet to our faith, to get into this living, to leave ourselves vulnerable to God, to serve with love and compassion, to care about one another and practice how we're supposed to live in the church so that we can live that way outside the church. We are in this together, which means we support one another, encourage one another, and hold one another accountable. 
You hold me accountable to my truth in God, not yours, and I hold you accountable to your truth in God, not mine. We experience God in different ways, and we serve God in different ways. This is the beauty of God's creation and God's church. So let us love one another as Christ loves us. Let us support one another as God supports us. And let us remember and act as though we are in this together. We are in this together as we go out to love, as we go out to serve, as we go out to represent Christ, as we go out and be the church. Amen.